Welcome to another video from English Einstein's. Today we're looking at English language paper one. As an AQA examiner, I know exactly what is needed to get the top scores. So I'm going to be talking you through the things I coach people to do. If you like the content, show your appreciation by clicking like and subscribe. I will also be showing my number one tip for boosting your grade and securing your place in the college you want. So make sure you watch all the way to the end. We're going to start off with question five, the 40 mark question, which I coach students to do first, because if you get this right, then you're already most of the way there. So here are the grade criteria, which no one else really shows. The first one that is talking about confidently matching the purpose it means not writing analytically like you would for Macbeth or a Christmas Carol, but writing creatively. For example, the sky was a lattice of sapphires glistening instead of more specifically, the metaphor shows this. I put a box around the three most important criteria. So ambitious vocabulary I'll be sharing with you. Linguistic devices we'll be constructing together. And the last one, range of punctuation. Also, make sure you write in full paragraphs. I know it sounds simple, but people do forget to do that and that restricts their marks. One tip is to start each sentence with a different word to make it more interesting to read. From marking papers, I've seen that 50% of people might describe a blue sky as blue when there are a plethora of shades you can recruit. Choose three of these to memorize and use in your exam. Now choose three positive and three negative emotions. You can add others such as melancholy, jubilance. When you get a picture, you decide whether it's negative words throughout or positive words throughout. Reminder of the structure for question five then. Start stands for sky, tiny details, away, reaction, and two was two. And you write one paragraph for each of those sections. Also, a coast map reminds you what to put in each paragraph. So when you get your exam, what I would do for the first five minutes, plan what you're going to put in the sky paragraph, then in the tiny details paragraph. For example, sky, I'm going to put an adverb, duplicitously and similes about the moon. In the tiny details paragraph, I'm going to write personification and I'm going to use the five senses. OK, that's my first five minutes. I'm going to be planning what I'm going to put into each section. Now use this paragraph structure with the motion words you wrote and the shades of blue or grey from this diagram. The idea is to keep the mood the same. Notice the metaphor of brushstrokes and canvas being used for early marks. This is something you can do directly in your exam. So pause the video now and write up your first paragraph. Here are sentence starters for the T paragraph. Sometimes it may be hard to pick tiny details, but revise six to ten of these keywords and you can use them in conjunction with the sentence starters. Remember a coast map, a simile for the waves would be good. The waves were roaring like a stampede of wildebeest. The sky was shrieking like a ghoul in the night. On this paragraph, you zoom out. I have boxed the colons and semicolons because, as I have said before, they are important for the marks. Cacophony means multiple sounds. The colon introduces a list. So you describe the sounds here. So there was a cacophony and then you introduce a list of sounds there using the colon to introduce them. The semicolon separates main clauses, so you can use this exact sentence structure to get your semicolons in. All you have to do is just add some keywords in there. So it was a palace of duplicity. It was a place of transgression. It was a time of misanthropy with a semicolon in between each of those main clauses. For the R paragraph, you create an event. It can be a tiny event. The smaller, the better, in fact and you describe the reactions to that event. So it could be that one of the boards of the pier cracked and decaying wood sunk into the abyss like distant memories. The final T stands for two was two. One sentence punchy paragraph. You just fill in the gaps. For example, to watch this video was to understand success. Or to wander this dystopia was to witness the depths of hell. You just fill in the gaps after two and after was two. So once more, to watch this video 
was to understand success. Moving on to question four. So as it says here, usually the statement will be split into two parts. Write two paragraphs addressing each. This is a question where I've seen the largest percentage of marks dropped. In fact, lots of people get four marks, five marks out of 20 because you need to write a lot for this question. It's 20 marks. So write two paragraphs about each of the points made in the statement. The topic sentence should indicate a level of agreement with the statement. For example, I wholeheartedly agree with the statement because, or I partially agree with the statement because, use a range of short quotations throughout, analyze the methods the writer has used, the verbs, nouns, adjectives, similes, metaphors, etc. And then in the green there are some higher higher end tactics there, using hedging words to evaluate. Clearly the writer has done this. However, I disagree with this part of the statement because so you're evaluating and debating the, the truth of the statement. And then finally, use complex sentence to explore nuanced ideas. While I agree with this part because of this, I also partially disagree with this because of this. Well, although this part is true, I disagree with this part because of this. You get a statement. And it asks whether you agree or disagree with the statement. You have to indicate the level of agreement. You get a statement and it asks if you agree or not. For, so, for example, a student said the writer creates a vivid picture of the location, not only describing what we see in detail, but using the other senses too. To what extent do you agree? Evaluate how the writer has created this impression. Where it says how the writer has created these impressions, they want to know what techniques they've used. And then it says support your opinions with references to the text. References means quotes. So the two key areas they're talking about methods, techniques, and quotes. Also, you could agree, partly agree, disagree, or completely disagree with the statement. It's more than likely you will agree. In fact, I always recommend just agreeing with the statement. But you do get more marks sometimes if you have one point of disagreement. So it's not 100% agreement, there's one point of disagreement, part potentially with the statement. Sometimes there are two or multiple parts of the statement, as indicated in blue, up above. Use a quote and use some terminology to explain why you agree or disagree. So we'll read this extract for question four. As we're reading through, look for quotes that support the statement the student made. So is the writer describing things vividly? Are they using their other senses? The wagons were moving downhill into a bowl-shaped valley that marked the mountain's summit, a palace sitting at its centre. An outer wall curved around the grand palace structure, echoing the concentric circles of the black staircase. Terracotta rooftops dipped in towards its centre, the courtyard beyond not yet visible in the approach. Towers thrust up from the outer wall towards the clouds, their brickwork and ornate tapestry of black and white banded marble. The heat was oppressive. Drew felt it roll over him in waves. Occasional jets of steam broke through fissures in the ground on each side of the road, and hot gases belched violently from the earth. He held his hand to his mouth, gagging at a familiar scent in the air. Brimstone, he said, as much to himself as to anyone who might listen. That's right, said another slave, leaning against the bars on the opposite side of the wagon. Sulphur, what else would you expect from a volcano? So we're going to analyse this quote here. The grand palace structure, towers thrust up from the outer wall towards the cloud and the colossal building. Because this quote agrees with the part of the statement where it says the writer used a vivid description. So the adjective grand suggests the palace is vast and majestic and has an overwhelming effect on the reader the personification of thrust up that's something that humans do thrust things up in the air the personification of thrust delineates or describes an imposing intimidating exterior and also the adjective colossal incites fear, anxiety, trepidation. Trepidation means anxiety. 
as you can see, there is a semantic field linked to size and magnitude and vastness. We've got grandness, colossal towers thrust up towards the cloud. A semantic field is where there are many words with similar meanings. Next quote. This one agrees with the second part of the statement about the writer using the other set the other senses to describe the scene. So the heat was oppressive. The adjective oppressive is also personification because oppression is something humans do to one another. This portrays the heat as almost tyrannical and unforgiving. Where it says Drew felt it roll over him in waves, talking about the heat. Heat doesn't literally roll over him in waves. It's metaphorically rolling over him in waves and it's submerging. It's almost as if he's metaphorically submerged and engulfed by the potent heat. Gagging at a familiar scent implies an odious stench, a grotesque, foul, ab abhorrent smell. So as you can see, the writer is using the other senses. So we can agree with that part of the statement. Here are the sentence starts and twos. So obviously, here we've only looked at two quotes. In your real exam, we'll write at least four paragraphs. So as you can see in purple, we start with a topic sentence for each paragraph, indicating the level of agreement. I wholeheartedly agree that the writer creates a vivid picture of the location. Additionally, I agree that the writer describes the scene using a number of senses. For example, is where you put the quote in and then use the sentence starters and the notes you just got to write out those paragraphs. So pause there, spend 10, 15 minutes writing out those two paragraphs. Should give you an idea of what's needed for your question four in language paper one. Question three, then, looking at structure. The main aim of the question three here is to work out the focus in each section and why that is the focus. These are key words you can use. The writer shifts the focus to this, or the focus then shifts to this, or the writer lingers on this topic because these are key words to use. Also, what has been concealed and revealed. The writer conceals this because, and then right at the end, the writer reveals this because. Keywords. So you need a structure phrase. So at the beginning of the extract, the writer does this. Then a textual reference, so a quote. And then why is that bit there? So let's have a look at an example. At the beginning of the extract, the writer zooms in on the picture book mountain setting. So we've got the structure phrase zooms in, textual reference picture book. And then this is the important bit as well. Why is that bit there? This mirrors the calm, tranquil feelings of the characters in the story. This is a really good example of what to put. However, this is an example of what not to put. This makes the reader want to read more. So many people will be writing that and it gives us no extra information at all. It's really bland. OK, make sure make sure you're writing something more along these lines here. The, this mirrors the calm and tranquil feelings of the characters in the story. You can analyse the focus at the beginning, middle and end of the act. But it's even better if you write about the focus change in each paragraph. So you could have eight to ten points of, of focus shift or focus lingering. The focus then shifts can be repeated several times. So you would write at the beginning, the writer zooms in on this. For example, put the quote in and then you could be this draws our attention to something because the writer wants to make the reader feel intimidated or inquisitive, for example. So let's look at our question three extract then. Curious incident of the dog in the night time. It was seven minutes after midnight. So straight away, the focus on time, which makes the speaker seem rational, as though he, prefer, he or she prefers order. It was seven minutes after midnight. The dog was lying on the grass in the middle of the lawn in front of Mrs. Shear's house. Its eyes were closed. It looked as if it was running on its side the way dogs run when they think they are chasing a cat in a dream. But the dog was not running or asleep. The dog was dead. So a description of the, the focus then shifts to a description of the dog, which builds suspense. Then we have this short sentence, which shocks the reader. Moving on then. 
There was a garden fork sticking out of the dog. The point of the fork must have gone all the way through the dog and into the ground because the fork had not fallen over. I decided that the dog was probably killed with the fork because I could not see any other wounds in the dog. And I do not think he would stick a garden fork into a dog after it died for some other reason, like cancer, for example, or a road accident. But I could not be certain about this. I went through Mrs. Shears's gate, closing it behind me. I walked onto her lawn and knelt beside the dog. I put my hand on the muzzle of the dog. It was still warm. So the focus has shifted to the speaker's position. It's in first person, which makes the reader feel involved and connected. <clears throat> the dog was called Wellington. It belonged to Mrs. Shears, who was our friend. She lived on the opposite side of the road, two houses to the left. Focus then zooms in on Mrs. Shears, making the reader feel compassion and sympathy for her. Wellington was a poodle. Not one of the small poodles that have hairstyles, but a big poodle. It had curly black fur. When you got close, you could see that the skin underneath the fur was a very pale yellow like chicken. The focus then zooms in on the dog and makes it seem innocent and fragile with the quote like chicken, building sympathy from the reader. Lastly, then, I stroked Wellington and wondered who had killed him and why. At the end of the extract, the speaker's curiosity reflects the curiosity of the reader. In the boxes are the notes you can use for question three. Like I said previously, you can do this as the bare minimum, maybe get four out of eight if you do this. But if you repeat the middle section a few times more, you can get up to eight out of eight. So the focus then shifts to can be repeated several times. Okay, So you can only do the first one once the extract opens with a focus on this. And the last one, the extract concludes with this, but the middle one you can do multiple times. Uh, you can do it once for every paragraph, in fact. Question two. Question two, you want to spend 10 minutes on. You want to analyse two or three methods, methods and their effect in each paragraph. Some methods should be explored in detail. The methods you should be looking for are verbs, adjectives, adverbs, similes, metaphor, personification, repetition, short sentences. And you can write about their effects on the reader. OK. You need to be thinking, you need to be finding the obvious quote, but telling the examiner the deeper meanings of those quotes. A bit like this iceberg here, we can see the top of the iceberg underneath is much more substance. So again, for this question, question two, you want a language technique, then a reference, a quote, and then why has the writer used that technique? For example, Shakespeare used a metaphor. When Malcolm describes Macbeth as a dead butcher. This suggests that Macbeth was ruthless, callous and a tyrant. So you've got the technique metaphor, quote, dead butcher, and then this suggests this. So this is the extract we're going to read for question two. We are confined to one cell block and not allowed in any other. From our cell block, we can go to the yard, the mess hall or our job. Movements are allowed hourly during a 10 minute period. Many of us spend our free time in the yard, which is a precious place indeed. In the yard, we have handball courts, tennis courts, weights, basketball, volleyball, a running track, green grass and miles and miles of blue sky and fresh air. It's the place where we play, shaking off the dust, disease and gloom of the cage. A man with an afternoon job may come to spend his mornings on the yard, afternoons at work and his evenings studying his cell. This routine is as certain to him as the years he must do. Back in the cell block, some of us remove our running shoes and go back to bed, sleeping all day and tossing and turning all night. Others sit in the stuffy cell block and watch the rays of sunshine filtering through the iron security screens on the windows. Down the bottom of the box then I've written juxtaposition between the rays of sun and the iron security screens reflects the misery of seeing freedom but being imprisoned. Sun symbolises hope, aspirations, liberation, but the iron screens reflect the inescapable incarceration or entrapment that the narrator is experiencing. OK, so that's the technique you talk about their juxtaposition. Use those, that quote there and those notes. Taking away the yard spoils our routine and unbalances our body clocks. 
Tempers begin to go bad. We snap at each other like too many rats crammed into a cardboard box. Hating becomes second nature. So we've got the simile, like too many rats crammed into a cardboard box. This portrays the prisoners animalistic, dehumanised, oppressed, victimised, reduced to vermin. Because they've been de- dehumanised so thoroughly, they're reduced to vermin. Also portrays them as unhygienic because rats are unhygienic. And the fact that it says crammed into a cardboard box means shows that he's perhaps surrounded by craftiness because rats are associated with, associated with craftiness. So what we're looking at is how does the writer use language to describe being confined in a prison? So the two boxes of information can help you answer this question, but this, those annotations are something you need to be doing in your exam by yourself. So these are the sentence starters I would use for question two. Evidently, the writer portrays, and then you can put one of these notes in, the writer portrays the misery of seeing freedom but being imprisoned. For example, rays of sunshine and the iron security screens. In other words, the sun represents hope and joy and aspiration. More specifically, the juxtaposition highlights the misery. Okay, so use the notes that we got and fill in the sentence starters. Additionally, the writer shows, and then you can use the second one, shows that the prisoners have been dehumanized by this confinement. For example, like too many rats crammed into a cardboard box. And then you analyze that quote with those sentence starters. Structure is going to improve your grade. Lastly, question one, you have to list four things about the dog from this paragraph. If you found this video helpful, make sure to check out my question five specific video seen here on the bottom left. See you next time.